Hey guys, welcome back to today's video. Today is Thursday, July 21st, 2022, and today we're going to be taking a look at the 2022 Senate Elections Model from Decision Desk HQ. Now, this is a model that has been long anticipated and one that I'm excited to go ahead and take a look at. I've looked at 538s, I've looked at Politico's, and now this is going to add into our understanding of where the Senate elections are right now and how they've changed over time, considering the past few events that have sort of shaken up some of our Senate races, whether that be primary or President Trump's involvement or lack thereof or potential upcoming primaries. A lot is changing about what we can expect and what we've seen thus far within our Senate elections, and I think it'll be very interesting to go ahead and take a look at. So baseline standard model, uh, what we find is that the Decision Desk HQ model says that the Democratic Party has a 55.1% chance at controlling the U.S. Senate. Now, I will be constantly referring to two main things when we're looking at these odds, the first thing being the predicted betting markets, which haven't really changed that much over the past 90 days. What you find is that Republicans had a much more considerably higher chance at winning control of the U.S. Senate. At one point, it was as high as nearly 78%, 79% if you were to translate it directly into percentages. That has dropped to about 60. Uh, and the reason for that, I think, largely is due to a lot of the events that I mentioned briefly, uh, whether that be a primary, for instance, Dr. Oz in the state of Pennsylvania, or an expected upcoming primary, for instance, Blake Masters in the state of Arizona. There seems to be a good amount of things shaking up the race, shaking up our Senate elections that have decreased the amount of confidence in the GOP. And you can also see that in the Decision Desk HQ overall model as it has changed over time, because looking back in early June, Republicans had about a 64% chance at winning the majority. That has dropped down to 55 to uh, lower than 55, 45% for obvious reason. As for the 538 model, we're also going to be taking a look at this is the second resource that I want to take a look at because it also is a model and it's one that goes through different formats. So you can take a look at the model according to just opinion polls, giving the Democrats a 65% chance. Classic includes fundraising, past voting patterns, and addition to polls, giving Democrats a 61% chance. Then you drop down to deluxe, which includes expert ratings, which still gives the Republican Party an advantage despite the other two not showing them in the advantage. So just something to take a look at, just something to reference. So let's go ahead and get started. As I said, 55% is the Democratic Party's chance, meaning that this model probably is one of the best models for the Democratic Party that we have seen thus far. So far, the Republican Party only needs to win just one seat from the Democratic Party, and that isn't going to change considering the majority is 50 to 50. Now, looking at this map, they seem to be characterizing some states that we might not necessarily always agree upon as being solid Republican states. The most notable one and the one that I think has received uh, a good amount of pushback on maybe from those online really just just deals with maybe the way the model was formulated, but it's the state of Wisconsin. Now, personally speaking, I don't know if I disagree entirely with this notion that it's going to be a red state. I haven't had it as a Democratic state since 2021. You take a look back at all of my predictions that have to go all the way back, I think, to August of 2021 was when Wisconsin, I even considered going to the Democratic Party. And even then, it was by a very narrow margin. I don't know if I'd go so far personally as to say it's a solid Republican state, but I don't think the call is off. I don't think that this is something that is entirely wrong. It might be something that people aren't expecting to see in a state as close as Wisconsin, but I do think that maybe the chances don't exactly add up to 95 to 5, but I do agree that it is going to go to the Republican Party, and a victor is a victor. It doesn't really matter entirely if these chances are right or not, because if a Republican wins it, that means this model was in fact correct. But that's just my own two cents, because I've seen a couple of people have a little bit of pushback on to that specific race, uh, but we can go ahead and take a look at the other races that we see within the race, uh, within the uh, overall national model. The state of Iowa, the Republican Party here, having a 99 greater than that, 99% chance at winning there. For some reason, we've seen some new polls out of the state that show it narrowing down to a single-digit race. It would be the closest in Chuck Grassley's entire career, I think the closest since 1980, potentially even closer than that one. Uh, it's expected to be narrower than elections prior, but it looks like Decision Desk HQ is very confident that the Republican Party is going to win there, which I don't disagree with either. But I do think that maybe we would start to see over the next couple of months as more data is released from the state that the odds for the Democratic Party's chance of victory does slightly increase. But honestly speaking, it just simply isn't going to happen, especially with our national environment. Missouri, very similar to the state of Wisconsin, about a 95-96% chance there for the expected Republican nominee. That is Eric Greitens, the former governor, uh, going on to currently be about even with uh, another, I believe, another person named Eric in that race. 
regardless though the race is competitive for the republican primary we don't know who it's going to be but we have a general idea and right now regardless of who that nominee is going to be about a 96 percent chance at republicans winning there according to this model you head over to ohio now this is actually a pretty competitive state according to this forecast i don't know entirely if i agree with it it's going to be this competitive but honestly speaking i don't like to argue with numbers i don't like to argue with analytics and i don't like to argue with data that's directly in front of me where you can actually see how the model ends up working so i would just go ahead and take a look at this and add this into my understanding and estimation for the upcoming midterms tim ryan is a good candidate i've said that very clearly since he was nominated since he was the practical front runner when no real democrat decided to run against him jd vance ran in a very contested republican primary it could have gone three different ways and it ultimately ended up going to him i can't say he's the best gop nominee he's definitely better than josh mandel but at the end of the day he definitely is a more vulnerable republican and if this was a neutral or potentially even a democratic wave year ohio would likely be leaning towards the democratic party but since it is 2022 78 percent isn't exactly uh that much underrepresenting the republican party's chances of victory in the state of ohio now the state of pennsylvania i agree with this i think this makes a lot of sense john fetterman is the incumbent lieutenant governor dr oz is of course the name that you know and recognize dr oz is that tv personality he's a celebrity from new jersey moved over to the state to decide to run nothing i just said there was partisan in my opinion i think looking at the race objectively <clears throat> the democratic party really looked out pat toomey is the incumbent there should he had ran for re-election i do think that he would be leading right now this race would not have been easy for democrats to win it's a swing state that biden only won by 1.2 percent it's a state that goes back and forth <clears throat> sorry about that voted for trump voted for biden refused to really go to the gop in 2018 but that's because it was a blue wave year 2014 however what you found is that pennsylvania was a bit pushing back on democrats in the house the governor's race did go to tom wolf but that was dealing with a lot more uh factors outside of the wave you go back to 2010 and there's so where you really see the red waves impact on the senate races the governor's races the house races all across the state of pennsylvania but a toss-up right now fetterman with the advantage wholeheartedly agree with that distinction new hampshire maggie hassan in the lead i think this one is actually very similar to the one we see on 538 70 30 that's very similar to what i remember seeing at least what is it here 72 to 28 not much of a difference there i think this makes a lot of sense maggie hassan <clears throat> Honestly speaking, I think it's on track to be reelected. I don't know if Don Bulldog is going to be the Republican nominee for U.S. Senate. That hasn't been shored up. We don't have the primary results yet. That primary has not been held yet. We will wait and see. But generally, these, uh, these chances are what we should expect for the state of New Hampshire. Moving down to the next state, the state of North Carolina. Now, I'm surprised to see it this close between Ted Budd and Sherry Beasley. I think that looking at 538s, it's a little bit more realistic for what we can expect. But generally speaking, these aren't too far off from each other. Just I would say I would definitely err on the side of giving Ted Budd a higher chance at victory. Uh, Sherry Beasley is a good candidate. I think that she in a neutral blue wave year would be able to win. I think where we are nationally, where North Carolina is with Biden's approval with the generic ballot, it just simply isn't going to be there. It would make sense in states such as maybe Arizona, Georgia, Pennsylvania, states that already went to Biden in the last election. North Carolina did not, meaning you'd need a more favorable year than it was for Biden in 2020, which is hard to sell. Yes, I think there are individual factors and uh, candidate quality things that could impact and benefit left and right wing candidates across the nation. But for right now, I think that North Carolina is definitely going to go to the GOP. I have it as a likely red state. And this chance here, I do agree with, um, but I would just slightly increase it in favor of Ted Budd. Moving over to the state of Georgia, another toss-up race here. I think that Warnock and Walker have been in a race that has been very competitive from the very beginning. But the fact that it has been competitive, I would say, is a bit alarming for the Republican Party. Now, they are in a very good chance at winning the state of Georgia. 538 currently gives them the advantage across the state. Personally speaking, I don't. I think that Georgia, especially more recently, has moved a little bit more to the left. You take a look at practically any data that's coming out of the state, in addition to the fact that you are seeing even Republican internals tell us this exact story, that Democrats are ahead in the Senate race. It does sort of, I, I, I would say, potentially scare Democrats that it is so close and that the expected margin here is not expected to be as large. Decision Desk HQ gives Raphael Warnock about a 63% chance of victory versus 538, which completely disagrees with that at a 47% chance. One has a Republican winning, the other has a Democrat winning. I do agree with this one more, just because it does say that Warnock is in the advantage. Uh, I, I'm excited to see what happens this November to see which model ends up being entirely correct or maybe more correct than the other. Uh, the Georgia race is definitely a toss up. I agree with that estimation. I agree with that understanding of the race. But I do also agree very much with this expectation that Warnock is going to win the Senate race in Georgia this November. Looking over at Florida, I think these results and these percentages make a lot, a lot of sense. Rubio definitely has the very high edge in the state of Florida. I honestly don't see it going blue. I really think that it would take uh, mountains to be moved in order for Florida to go blue. It was a very red state in 2016, very 
Secretary Red in 2010, uh, not on the presidential level, but on the Senate level with Marco Rubio in specific. I can't imagine that a year that is uh, going to be better for Florida Republicans now with their advantage in the voter registration, their advantage in uh, fundraising, et cetera, et cetera, is going to really do that much damage to Rubio's name, who is a, quite frankly, very popular figure, especially amongst minority voters in the state of Florida. Heading over to the next thing I want to talk about, we have the state of Colorado. Now, Michael Bennett is running against Joe Odea, who is the better GOP nominee, but I can't say he is entirely the most electable. Not many people expect the GOP to be that competitive in the state of Colorado, which is a bit different from what we saw in 2016. Now, in 2016, the expectation was that Colorado was going to go to Michael Bennett by a safe margin. That did not end up being true. The same thing could happen this time around, but I would caution it by saying that Colorado is significantly more left-wing than it was in 2016. What I mean by that is that Hillary Clinton only won the state by about five points in 2016. Joe Biden won Colorado by 14 points. When you remove this idea that the Democratic Party has a bad candidate or someone who is a lesser of two evils in this case, for example, Hillary Clinton, the Democratic Party does very well in the state. You take a look at 2018, they elected their governor by double digits. Uh, they are very popular with their governor here. Nothing seems to be adding up that even a red wave year such as 2022 <clears throat> could end up helping the GOP in a way that helps them win a Senate race that seems to be unwinnable at this point in time. 10% is a chance that personally I would take if I was to say, you know what, throw me into any race and I was to take a 10% chance at winning a Senate race. But this is Colorado, historically a swing state, was competitive in the last Senate election, except this time it doesn't seem like it's on track to be. And even if it was to swing in a proportion that the way Virginia did from 2020 or even 2017 to 2021, Colorado would still be blue. Regardless if it's the 12-point swing or the 10-point swing, Either way, Colorado is a 14-point Biden state. At most, it would be a Republican down two margin, meaning Democrats would still win their Senate race there. Just food for thought. And for the state of Arizona, Mark Kelly and Blake Masters, the expected GOP nominee here, the same one here on 538. They both similarly agree that Mark Kelly is on track for victory. I think Mark Kelly is going to win, and based off my rating, I would say that I have a higher expectation for the Republican Party, for the Democratic Party in Arizona than I do in some other states. Looking at Mark Kelly as a candidate, I think he has been very electable from the very beginning. He was the right candidate to field in 2020. I think he was a very strong one. And he defeated Martha McSally when Biden only defeated Donald Trump by 0.2%. Mark Kelly won by 2.4%. So <clears throat> there's a very big difference in terms of the margin, over two percentage points, which is very significant in a state that typically comes down to the wire, especially more recently. Looking at the chances at victory, I do think Blake Masters has a realistic shot, but I don't think it's greater than 50%. Meaning that Mark Kelly, I think at the end of the day, is the likeliest one to win the Senate race. And I would also agree with this distinction that it is lean Democrat. In the final race I really want to talk about, we have the Nevada race, which is characterized as a toss-up. Again, this one makes a lot of sense. Catherine Cortez Masto and Adam Laxalt have been in a very close race. Now, personally, I've had Nevada in the uh, Republican column. Previously, in the Democratic column, I hadn't had in the Republican column in quite some time. Uh, but looking at Nevada as it stands right now, I think Laxalt is one of the best GOP candidates that we have seen this election cycle. And I make a point of saying that in every video I talk about Nevada, because the GOP hasn't exactly had that many victories when it comes down to their nominees, at least in a lot of these states where it matters. You head over to New Hampshire, a prime target for the GOP a year and a half ago. They thought Chris Nunu was for sure going to run. He decides not to. Okay, so their backup was Kelly Ayotte, the former uh, New Hampshire senator. She says, nope, I'm not going to run either. You head over to Pennsylvania. Their front runner, Sean Parnell, endorsed by Trump, drops out. Who do they replace him with? Dr. Oz. Sean Parnell almost won in a district that the Democrats won in 2018 by over 15 points. He narrows it down to just three to four points in 2020. They had an electable Republican, but he decided to leave the race. Okay, vacancy of Pennsylvania, filled by someone who's worse. New Hampshire, they're scrambling to find the right GOP nominee. You head over to Ohio. J.D. Vance isn't even the strongest by any means. You head down to the state of Georgia. Herschel Walker, while the field was cleared for him, was definitely not their strongest. You head over to the state of Arizona. You have Blake Masters, who's arguably the less electable candidate between him and Brnovich. And what you find is that you are really reaching around, looking around the nation to find some successful victories for the GOP. Okay, maybe North Carolina with Ted Budd, I'd say, okay, that one makes sense. But the best one, and that's not saying much, honestly speaking, the best one I've seen thus far is the state of Nevada with Adam Laxalt. Laxalt, I think, is the favorite to win the Senate race. But honestly speaking, the margin and the percent chance here is close enough that it's realistic to see this as something that is a viable outcome and can probably explain why 
the overall model gives the Democratic Party about a 55% chance of victory. Now, you can see that this model has changed over time. Republicans used to be in the advantage at one point, a 64% chance at victory at winning control of the U.S. Senate. So definitely different times. Definitely things have changed over time and that has become much more apparent over the past month and a half. And I think we're going to start to see some very similar things happen across the nation and in some other models. 538 at a different point gave the GOP 60% in terms of a chance of victory. That has since dropped to about 51% uh, to the Democrats, 49%. And don't even get me started on these light and classic models. The Democrats is significantly increased their chance of victory based off some of these models when, previously speaking, the Republican Party was ahead. So by the final thing here, regardless of where you're looking at, the Democratic Party has a pretty good shot at retaining control of the U.S. Senate. In a year that should be so easy for the GOP to win, so many automatic pickups if this was any other type of red wave year, for the Democratic Party to be so competitive and so close to the GOP really does say something about the state of the race and the state of polarization and the inability for people to cross party lines, even if they necessarily disagree with President Biden or whichever president is in office at the time. Overall, we'll see what happens. It's a very close race. It is going to come down to the wire. It's going to come down to these very close and competitive states, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Nevada, North Carolina, Arizona. It will be very, very close, and it will ultimately be very impactful and very important for the Biden administration and Biden's future plans in the final two years of his first term, potentially going into a second. We'll see what happens in 2024. But Democrats are really hoping on, uh, holding on to hope that they do retain control of the U.S. Senate. But honestly speaking, a 50-50 Senate isn't going to help them that much, considering that Kristen Sinema and Joe Manchin are still going to be there, but it does prevent an obstructionist GOP in the U.S. Senate. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. Make sure to comment down suggestions below. Subscribe on the left if you haven't already, and check out the Instagram and Twitter. At the bottom left of the screen, there's also a Discord server for you to go ahead and join. On the screen, there's a video you can watch, and then a playlist for my 2022 Senate election analysis videos. Again, thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you all tomorrow.